So, um, my name is, he just said, is Joseph Huff. I'm the product marketing manager uh, for Carl Zeiss, specifically for the laser scanning microscopes uh, that we provide. Um, I want to thank you for this opportunity to talk a little bit with you today about the 710, uh, which, uh, as the presentation before me just mentioned, you guys have on campus. I thought it and have been asked to maybe cover some of the highlights, what's so unique about the 710, maybe verse, um, versus the 510s. Uh, our older confocal model, so and maybe why, how that would may hopefully be applicable to your research and maybe why you would want to use it. So with confocal laser scanning microscopy, it used to be, you know, when these first systems first came out on the market, maybe they were mostly used for generating nice pretty pictures, but today we can start thinking about doing a little bit more with them. In this case, uh, showing an example, doing something like colocalization where you can start looking at uh, if you had something labeled with a green dye and something labeled with a red dye, you can start to see what the likelihood or how much, um, what the presence of having both molecules in the same pixel, same physical location would be in making some sort of, um, some sort of analysis out of that. But if we start looking at what today's, you know, application needs for today, what do we need a confocal to do? We need, obviously, high quality optical sectioning. We need to look at very dim things because generally, uh, more and more people like to look at proteins, maybe expressing it at endogenous levels. Image multiple fluorophores accurately. Um, easy to use. Um, obviously, when it deeper is better. A lot of times, when you're using a confocal, looking for uh, deep z stacks. And obviously, if you have downtime, if the system's not reliable, it's going to affect your research. So, having a system that's easy to use, reliable, and very flexible is a benefit. So, the 710 going to cover five points, hopefully, quickly, because I know uh, maybe we're a little bit behind. I'm going to talk a little bit about the optical design of the 710 and why that's important for you. Uh, talk about how that optical design is, little, is flexible and talk about precision and reproducibility and what that means uh, with, a, with a spectral confocal, which is what the 710 is. As she mentioned, a uh, talk before me mentioned, there has live cell capability. Uh, talk a little bit about that. And then this whole idea of low maintenance, high efficiency, what that means and how that translates into uh, the software in particular. So I thought it might be helpful for those of you who don't know um, what confocal microscopy is or how that's different from, let's say, wide field microscopy. Uh, so and I don't know if there's a laser pointer, but with general conventional fluorescence microscopy, the idea is if you have the blue light coming out of an objective, so you're exciting, let's say, with, I don't know, a 488 nanometer laser, you would not only excite any fluorophore that falls within that double cone, you would also collect any fluorescence that would originate from that double cone. And if you have a thick tissue specimen, what you'll get is a lot of blurring, as demonstrated in that image. If you do something in your optical path to only allow you to collect light from a very small subset of what you're exciting, then you can start to get a, very, a nice, highly, uh, or increase your contrast, i.e., translate into resolution, a resolution increase. So that the way this works with the confocal, you have a laser, you send that laser to your sample to a diffraction limited spot. Presumably, if your sample has some sort of dye in it, things fluoresce, the objective collects the fluorescence, goes up through a beam splitter which separates any uh, laser light from your fluorescence and hits your detector, which for, uh, for an LSM is a photomultiplier tube. At which point, what makes an LSM an LSM is that you situate a pinhole in a conjugate focal plane from your sample that will block any light that does not originate from um, the focal plane. So this allows you to get, generate a nice thin optical section. Since you're doing this at one point, the idea is now you scan that laser across an entire field of view and you build up an image point by point by point that is a very well contrasted image because you're blocking a lot of out of focus light. So what do you, how does this translate to the 710? Why is it so unique? And we'll go through maybe a couple of the highlights of the bits and pieces, but this is a picture of what's inside the box if you've ever used one. So when we start talking about the 710 and what's important with confocal microscopy, it's not only just having to pinhole to block out of focus light. You may think that's all well and good. But if we look at an image, a typical image, and ask the question, if we took an image on a more, less sensitive system and a more sensitive system, we may ask, okay, how do I know which systems, more, you know, what, what system's gonna give me the best sensitivity? Well, if you, just, if you look at the image on the left, you may think, well, that, of course, that one's gonna come off the more sensitive system, but that's not true. 
sensitivity, we can define it by, it's, your, it's not necessarily a bright, the brighter your image, the better your sensitivity, it's your signal to noise. Signal to noise is, cr is more, much more crucial than quote unquote image brightness. And the reason for this is it's obviously defined by the amount of signal you collect over the noise. But if you start looking at an image that may be very bright, but if you have a lot of background, your signal to noise is not so good. Therefore, your, your data is not going to be so good. And the idea is, if you can reduce the amount of noise you have in your system, and that's generally due to dark noise, electronic noise, a laser reflection, which uh, for if you've, any of you have used a 510, that was a, uh, compared to the 710, that's a major source of noise, as, long as, as well as electronic noise. And we'll talk about that here in a minute. So if we can minimize the noise, we can very quickly increase our signal to noise, i.e. increase the overall flexibility and the, what samples we can put on and have success with. Okay, so what aspects of the 710 versus the 510 make it so much better in terms of improving signal noise? I would say the biggest thing would be the main beam splitters that are used on the 710 versus the 510. A 510 uses a traditional 45 degree angle dichroic. And remember, the dichroic is what sends your laser light to your sample and rejects any scattered laser light from hitting your detector. So with the 710, we've redesigned this main beam splitter and has about a 10 to the fifth better laser suppression. So that means any fluorescence that hits your detector, any light hitting your detector, is truly from your sample your fluorescence and not scattered laser light. Uh, in addition, the 710 is what's considered a completely spectral confocal. So with the 510, you would have a series of secondary dichroics and emission filters that you would have to count on matching up to whatever fluorophore you're using. With the 710, that's not the case, there are no secondary dichroics or emission filters. You have what's called a, um, a holographic diffraction grating, which, as you can see, separates the light based on wavelength. With the 510, this did have something called, uh, did have a version of this, it was called the meta detector. The 710, it's been a little redesigned because with the meta detector, you have probably about a 30% loss um, through the grating. Now, that's believe it's over 93 percent efficient uh, collection so you no longer have severe light loss through and the other thing you now have is just like with computers electronics get better and better and that translates into PMTs you have an 80 percent reduced dark noise so there's a couple uh, fundamental design things we can do in order to pre improve reduce our signal increase or excuse me increase our signal reduce our noise and the other thing that the way that the 710 works for us, the 510 is now we're running um, something called a digital oversampling electronics. So when you start to think about we're collecting photons per pixel as we scan across, the way that we turn these photons into electrons so we can read them out has changed and in the sense now we're collecting 30% more signal per pixel, which again translates into a higher sensitivity. There's other things. So I mean kind of comparing a lot to the 510 uh, versus 710. If we look at what's called a lambda stack from a 510 versus 710, the 510, each one of these boxes represents a 10 nanometer block of light. So if we start at the top left corner, that's going to say be 400 nanometers moving across as a raster scan in the bottom right, maybe being 600 nanometers. And what you'll see, these two white boxes in the middle where the signal is completely saturated out, is right where a laser line falls. And this is a direct result of insufficient laser suppression from the dichroics on the LSM 510. If we now take the same sort of sample and put it on the 710, you'll notice that the boxes where the laser line falls are black. That's because we are completely suppressing any laser light that gets scattered back from our sample and allows us to balance our image appropriately and get adequate signal to noise so then we can start doing actual research. So if we translate this into maybe not a lambda stack, but a, a just a more a general image, I apologize, this doesn't always show up the best on projectors, but what you would see is a much higher background, if you look at the monitor or the laptop, a much higher background on the image on the left, again, due to this sort of haze that you get from uh, scattered laser light that you don't get on the 710, okay? So with, what do I mean by greater flexibility? So, okay, great, we have wonderful signal to noise on the, on the 710. So what is so why is it so flexible? Well, w one thing that the 710 utilizes is something called a pigtailed laser concept. And what this means is each laser has its own input fiber 
that can be directly and easily, it's as simple as taking the fiber and clicking it on the scan head and it's automatic, it's basically, it's aligned for that laser and away you go. So these can all be, you can add any laser line you like in the field uh, in this manner, which was not the case with the LSM 510s. And the other thing, not only is the bean splitter much more efficient, we have up to 50 different combinations. So you can combine any laser that you have, any laser line you have on your system and any combination you see fit, which is of benefit to you because now not only do you not have secondary dichroics, which means you don't have to rely on emission filters being present on the system to meet the fluorophores you want to use, but now you can use any laser combination you like and not have to worry about, again, the dichroic being present from the factory. So when we start talking about, again, flexibility, we need to also talk about the detection unit that's present on the 710, and this is something called a quasar unit. I believe what you guys, what's present here on campus is the 34 channel quasar detection unit, which is, consists of one 32 element PMT array with two side flanking PMTs. So if you imagine you have multiple fluorophores in your sample, all emitting to different wavelengths, how can we start using this detector scheme to only image in, you know, certain dyes? All right, so don't quite remember why the animation was in here. So the idea is now we can say, all right, the first 10 elements of this 32 element array, I'm going to assign to, let's say, DAPI. The middle part, I'm going to assign to uh, Alexa 48. The back half, I'm going to assign to uh, Mito Tracker Red. Okay. The reason you can do this is because the grading is already doing the wavelength separation for you. So now all you have to do in the software is, because you know where you've calibrated each element where it falls in the, in the emission spectrum, you can start to group together these elements to get a pseudo um, uh, user-defined channel collection. The other thing you can do is move in what's called a prism aperture group into the separation in a very, in a one nanometer step size in order to separate the light to make, or excuse me, utilize the side flanking PMT. So now you can do, uh, in this case, in this example, four flu five fluorophores simultaneously. And the system will allow you if, you, if you could design a setup this way, you can do up to 10 channels uh, simultaneously if you so desired. The other way that you can image is, again, doing something called a lambda mode. So instead of trying to pick um, spectral collection bands that you are assigned to only one floor for, you just inquire the entire spectra so that you have, um, in this case, a 32-point 32, 32 uh, spectra for per pixel so that you can start to do something called uh, spectral imaging or linear unmixing. Okay, and we'll talk about that here in a second. So unmixing. What I mean by linear mixing is a re result of doing lambda stacking, lambda imaging. Let's take the example of um, amino labeled Drosophila eye. In this case, we're looking at Psi 3 and Alexa 48. If you've ever imaged Drosophila eye, you will know that there is a uh, high presence of autofluorescence. So you can start, you can use lambda imaging to help you profile what the autofluorescence looks like versus the two uh, fluorophore signals you have on there and r remove it. So what you'll see is what's called a lambda coded view, meaning we haven't done any unmixing on it. We do run the unmixing algorithms because we know what the spectra for Alexa 48 and Psi 3 look like and the autofluorescence. There's some math done and you can back out the autofluorescence and be left only with your signal, okay? And do, 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 do. So extend the live cell capabilities with the 710. And of course my movie's not gonna play now. So, well, benefits of the 710 for live cell imaging, they're very easy. Because you have a much better signal noise, because of laser suppression or laser suppression, things like that, lower electronic noise, you can now turn your laser power very low. I apologize, maybe I can play the laser this way. Keep your laser power low, which translates into keeping your cells alive much longer because you're going to reduce phototoxicity. I believe this was the well, wrong one. Well, you get the idea. So this was taken on a 710. This is uh, microtubules. Lots of many, many, many things you can do with the 710 for live cell imaging. You have full control over CO2 levels, uh, temperature levels. You also have the ability to do cooling if you would like on the stage. 
And this is all implement can be controlled through a, the touchpad interface or through the software, and it's kept, any settings you have is kept along with your image and the metadata of the image. So in terms of low maintenance, if you have students, or if you are a student, you don't know anything about confocal microscopy, what's really nice about the software that drives our system is something called Zen. It utilizes something called smart setup. So let's say you only know what fluorophores you have in your sample. You don't really know anything else. You can go into the smart setup menu, and from a drop-down box, you can tell what fluorophores you have, pick an acquisition strategy, and hit apply. And the system sets itself up for you and picks the correct lasers, picks the correct collection bands, select, like I said, select your method, and hit apply. The next thing you do is hit what's called auto exposure. It sets the detector settings for you, and you will have acquired an image within probably four or five button clicks. It's that, it can be that simple uh, on the seven tens. So the other thing you can do is start, okay, so great, I can take one image at one plane that doesn't really do anything for me. You can start multiplexing this with um, taking multiple Z stacks. You're taking an optical section at different planes. You can start adding in tile scans so you can expand your field of view and stitch those tiles together. You can take and couple in, you want to do a, do a tile scan Z stack over an hour long or overnight. You can start doing time series. So there's all sorts of multi-dimensions that aspects that you can do. It's as easy as checking the box and hitting start experiment. So with that, um, the key benefits of the 710, the optical design is designed to increase sensitivity or increase your signal noise through uh, better laser suppression, better electronics, um, greater flexibility, the, the spectral scanning or having the 32 element array allows you to have complete flexibility in using any die you like whether those dies have overlapping emission spectra or not. Um, fully integrated life cell capabilities, say CO2, temperature, humidity, things like that, all integrated in the software and the ease of use and the low maintenance aspect um, with the software will also keep you, uh, should keep you running consistently. So. With that, I guess we're doing questions later. But if you have questions now, I'll have an answer.